You may be seated and let's pray. Father, thank you for words like that that we can sing to you to help realign our hearts and our minds, to lift our minds up to the things above where Christ is, and to remind us that there is so much more than this life here that we live now. But we thank you for this life now because you have provided something for us in this life now that prepares us for the next with Jesus beyond this body. We thank you for the, the gospel. We thank you for your son's death at the cross. We thank you for his shed blood in our place so that through faith in him, we have everything we need for this life, but also for when we see you. Oh, Lord, we long for um, hearts that are stirred up with greater affections for you even today. Help us as we open your word to do that. that. This would be a time of worship of you. Let us see you in all of your goodness and all of your greatness. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's take our Bibles this morning and open them up to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. I'm going to give you a statement right at the very beginning that you will never read on page one of the New York Times, that you will never read in chapter one of any college textbook, and you will not see it pinned at the top of any Twitter account. It's this. The human race is an indivisible unit of rebellion against God. One inseparable whole lump of unrighteousness under sin and under God's wrath. It's quite a first statement to make anywhere, even in a sermon. But you'll never see that on page one of any newspaper. You'll never read that in any first chapter in any textbook. But when you open Paul's letter to the Romans, that's what you get on page one of it. Those are essentially the words of Paul's gospel in the book of Romans. According to Romans 1, we, we have no excuse for that condition that we are in. We are culpable. We have intentionally chosen that sinful condition. We, we know the truth about God according to Romans 1. We know that he is divine in his nature. We know that he has eternal power that created everything. We know this truth from external witness outside of us, from creation telling us, but we also know it from an internal witness within because God himself made it evident within us and to us, we're told in Romans 1. We choose in rebellion and in sin against that truth to suppress it. We try to choke it out. We try to squeeze the life out of that truth about God so that we don't have to be accountable to it. And it's all in vain, according to the first page of Romans. We also then aren't satisfied with just trying to choke out the truth. We invent evil and lies. And we foolishly then cast ourselves on them and not God's truth. We try to displace God's truth with our lies. And in all this rebellion, we're not trying to kill the idea of worship or the practice of worship. It's far more personal to us, according to the first page of Romans. We actually want to just kill God. Romans 1 tells us that we are haters of God. And that's just not right. It's called in Romans 1, unrighteousness. It's probably a key word for Romans chapter 1, unrighteous. God's response to us on that first page of Romans is, is wrath. Three times he says there, Paul does, that God gave us over. 
God gave us over. God gave us over. It's, a, it's God taking his judicial hand, grabbing us by the back of the collar, and giving us over into our unrighteousness in the prison cell of unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. Romans 1 describes for us really a, a hellish existence for mankind right now from God's perspective. We write songs about how wonderful life is. And from God's perspective, he says it's, it's quite different for the human race. And what we do there in our prison cell of unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath as we live with each other is, is we cheer one another on in further unrighteousness. But many among us become very offended at such a being lumped into such a one-dimensional, monolithic, inflexible, one-size-fits-all indictment. In fact, maybe even you this morning are feeling like, that's not me. Many of us protest that indictment that we've been lumped into with everyone else, and, and we try to put forward evidence that we're not like the rest. We're not like the whole. Many of us are very unwilling, we're actually very willing to judge the rest as indeed unrighteous. In fact, we'll even be the first ones to throw stones in judgment at others. But the truth on the second page of Romans is that there are no exceptions. Not one of us has distinguished himself from the rest. We practice the very same unrighteous things as the rest. The one-size-fits-all indictment, according to Romans 2, actually still fits. And you'll never read that on page 2 of the New York Times or in the second chapter of any textbook in any college. And Romans chapter 2 to chapter 3, verse 20, unfolds how the gospel labors to keep all of humanity indivisible under sin and God's wrath. Not one person can peel himself off as a distinguished, morally superior person from the rest in the prison cell of unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. Not one. There is none righteous, the gospel says. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, meaning not one person has distinguished himself from the others. Perhaps a key expression on the second page of Romans, in Romans 2, would be no exceptions. So key word on the first page, unrighteous. Key phrase on the second page, no exceptions. So what Paul is showing us from the outset in his letter to the Romans is that the gospel labors first to solidify the indictment against all of us, the one-size-fits-all indictment of unrighteousness. And then the gospel labors to silence us, anybody who would try to protest that indictment, anyone who would try to separate himself off from the rest. Every mouth must be closed. And all the world, look at Romans chapter 3, verse 19. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. You see, Paul is very careful to keep it all together. Nobody peeled off from this mess of humanity. And it is so important that the gospel, sooner than later, achieve this in you, that it would actually silence you and me in our protests against being lumped in with all of the rest of unrighteous humanity, because as long as you keep voicing your protest, that means that you're not done with you yet. It means that you're still impressed with with something about yourself and that you can, you can, you can distinguish yourself from the rest. And in that condition, as you are trying to distinguish yourself from the rest, you will never look 
away from yourself to see God's solution outside of you, for you. And that's where Paul has us now in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and following. It's the good news that lies outside of you if you will accept the bad news about you. You're unrighteous. I'm unrighteous, like all of the rest. And, and you have not, and you will not ever distinguish yourself apart from the unrighteous mass of humanity. That's God's testimony to you in the gospel. And when you accept that from the gospel, then you will look away from yourself and you will look away from your own unrighteousness to see that which you do not have but that you must have if God is ever going to change his disposition of wrath towards you. What is that that you don't have but that you must have if God is ever going to change his disposition of wrath towards you? It is God's righteousness. God's righteousness. God's righteous status. And, and that's the key phrase for this next part, this last part of Romans 3. God's righteousness. You remember the first key word of Romans, unrighteous. Chapter 2, key phrase, no exceptions. Third key word, God's righteous status. It's the solution. And it's outside of you. And it's in God. And it's in Christ through his death, all by faith. This is the gospel's answer to your own unrighteousness and to the fact that you cannot distinguish yourself apart from the rest. The gospel knows what it's doing in my life and in your life. It knows what your only hope is. My only hope is what your only hope is, is what every man and woman's only hope is. And it's that God would only see his righteousness when he looks at us in the prison cell of unrighteousness that we dwell in at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. If he will only see his righteousness, we have hope. Romans 3, 21 through 26 is full of features of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners. We'll put that up on the screen for you. And we'll review back through the first three that we've already covered. Let me read it, though, for you. Romans 3, 21 to 26. Paul says, But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time. So that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The first gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is what we covered last week. Number one, God's righteous status is found entirely separate from our works. Verse 21, but now apart from law, apart from law, righteousness, the righteousness of God has been manifested, has been revealed. If unrighteous sinners like us in our prison cells of unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, and I'm going to say that over and over and over because that's true. That's us. We forget that. I forget it. 
But if that's who we are and that's where we truly are right now, if we think that the way out of our predicament with a holy God is simply to add some law, add some rules, some moral laws to our lives, verse 21 says that God's righteous status, which we need but don't have, will not be found that way. Look back up at verse 20. Paul said it already. By the works of law... In other words, when you put a law around your life, some rules, and you get to work with it, by works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. He looks on that and he says, no righteousness there, no declaration of righteousness there. Apart from that, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners has no interest at all ever in being associated with your good works or mine. The addition of law, the addition of rules, the addition of religious practices and ceremonies for the purpose of establishing proof for why you should not be judged for the purpose of establishing proof why you are an exception from the rest, will never reveal God's righteous status. That, that effort will never reveal God's righteous status that you desperately need. See, God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners, it's on the opposite side of, it is altogether separate from, it is in a different universe from, it is mutually exclusive to, it absolutely never commingles with ever your works of law. God has not manifested or he has not revealed his righteous status for sinners there. Apart from that, the righteousness of God has been established the second gospel feature of God's righteous status that we went over last week that is for unrighteous sinners in salvation is this. Number two, the Old Testament testifies in agreement with God's righteous status in the gospel. The Old Testament agrees with what we just said. The law and the prophets, this is being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's a title for the God-breathed, inerrant, infallible, older testament the Older Testament has, has seen the manifestation of God's righteous status that is entirely separate from good works. The Old Testament has seen that. But Paul is saying much more than that. Paul is saying that the Old Testament testifies that this manifestation of God's righteous status, which is entirely apart from your good works, that that is true. And that is good, and that is the only way that God has ever dealt with unrighteous sinners. The Older Testament confirms, it agrees with the gospel's teaching in the New Testament that God's righteous status does not come through good works done by unrighteous sinners. The Old Testament affirms this. It, it, the Old Testament affirms that the gospel is not a new religion, different from what you find in the Old Testament. The gospel is on the very same tracks as the Old Testament. Go all the way back to Adam and his sin and Eve's sin. When Adam crawled into the tall weeds with his rebel wife after they sinned against God, and they began their evil intentions there, their evil inventions against the God that they now hated, God never thought once that he would reveal his righteous status that they desperately need. He never thought once that he would reveal it in connection with any good works that they might do in the tall weeds. We can break down the law and the prophets into the law and then the prophets in the Old Testament. The law's sacrificial system never taught Israel, that God's righteous status came through an unrighteous sinner's obedience to that law. And the prophets who cried out against God's rebellious people, they never urged them to do good works so that God's righteous status could be revealed through their works of law. Your Old Testament 
and your New Testament are in complete agreement on where God's righteous status is not found, not revealed. Both the Old Testament and the gospel affirm that God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners is never revealed through your good works or through mine. Your Older Testament and your Newer Testament are not in conflict with one another. The third gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation that we covered last week is this. Faith in Jesus is the instrument through which God's righteous status comes. Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Whenever an unrighteous sinner in the prison cell of unrighteousness, at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath that we all live in, whenever one of them tries to, at there, at the bottom, do good works, God's righteous status is never revealed there, but it is only ever revealed through the unrighteous sinner who believes Jesus. That's the only place. If you look over in a, one corner and there's a group of them trying to put law around themselves to distinguish themselves from the rest, you can be assured God's righteous status is not there. But wherever an unrighteous sinner simply just believes Jesus, through that faith, God, his righteous status, comes to that unrighteous sinner. And that's just so incredibly humbling. All that I have ever produced on my own, in my own life, and all that you have ever emitted from your own life is unrighteousness. That's what the gospel says about you. And here's how bad it is. The gospel says also that if you try in that condition to put any rules around you and get to work, God's righteous status that you desperately need will not be found there. It will not be manifested in your life. But the gospel says simply, in your unrighteousness, believe Jesus. And God's righteous status that you desperately need is revealed in your life through faith. And that leads us to the fourth gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation. Here it is. This is new today. Number four, faith in Jesus is the one hope. Faith in Jesus is the one hope for all unrighteous sinners. Verse 22, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The last part of verse 22 and all of 23 are like a parenthesis to this line in verse 22. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. The parenthesis provides an explanation, especially for the all those who believe. Remember, Paul is working hard to kind of lump everything up and keep it together. Paul reminds us of the gospel's all-encompassing indictment over all of humanity and also that there are no distinguished groups within that whole lump of humanity. There is no distinction. There is a one-size-fits-all indictment against mankind. It is that we are unrighteous. It is that we have sinned. It is that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And what Paul is driving deep here is that if... We indeed are an indivisible, unsegregatable mass with a one-size-fits-all indictment, then there is only a one-size-fits-all solution for the mass of humanity. Faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Why is there a one-size-fits-all solution, which is faith in Jesus Christ? Verse 22, because there is no distinction. There is no distinction. No one in the prison cell of unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath has ever distinguished himself to be above others and therefore to be above faith in Jesus. There is no distinction. Faith in Jesus is that man's one hope as an unrighteous sinner. 
And the other direction on that is true as well. No sinner in the prison cell of unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath has made himself so odious that faith in Jesus will have no effect on him. He is not beyond the reach of what faith in Jesus was designed by God to do because there's no distinction that way either. Some may like to think that there are, you know, there are haves and there are have-nots in the prison cell of unrighteousness, but there are no distinctions. We are all have-nots. That is the one-size-fits-all indictment, and God has designed a one-size-fits-all solution. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Not a sincere faith in something else, but faith in Jesus Christ. Faith reveals his righteous standard for all who believe. He says that in verse 22. Because there's no distinction. And why is there no distinction? Because all have sinned. And all are falling short of the glory of God. He puts us back into the mass of rebel humanity. Let me give you a, maybe an illustration. Let's say you, you, you're sitting in the lobby of a physical therapy face, place or a, a rehab facility of some sorts, and as you're talking with people around you, um, there are some there who, who needed to have invasive, radical surgery. And then there's somebody else there who just needed a simple outpatient procedure. And there's yet another person who's just there in need of counseling. You see, in that setting, there was not a one-size-fits-all problem, and therefore there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. But you won't hear any of that kind of talk in regards to sinners in salvation in the gospel. The gospel says that we're more like a morgue or cemetery. We are all spiritually dead in our unrighteousness. And therefore, we all need equally one thing, life, life. There are no distinctions in the morgue. One dead person doesn't say, I've got more life than he does. Oh, wait, I'm dead. And there are not distinctions among us, according to the gospel. When you hear the guy with the, with the radical testimony, you know, the guy who had the terrible before Christ life, he didn't need more grace. He didn't need more shed blood from a substitute who's Jesus. He didn't need more forgiveness than the sweet little girl whom God saved when she was young, but she was a little less polished in her practice of unrighteousness than him. Pharisee Saul, who killed Christians, and young teenage Mary, who is the mother of Jesus, have the same problem and need the same answer. Faith in Jesus Christ. There is no distinction because all have sinned and all are falling short of the glory of God. The unrighteous mass murderer is so incapable of producing the righteousness that God accepts that he must exercise faith in Jesus so that God's righteous status can come to him through that faith. And we would all agree with that. But the same is true exactly for me and you, even if we have not been mass murderers. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only hope for all unrighteous sinners. And notice Paul repeats this description of the mass of humanity. In verse 22, he says, um, I'm sorry, in verse 23, for all have sinned. He said that already. Go back to chapter 2, verse 12. Look at this. For all who have sinned without law will also perish without law, and all who have sinned under law will be judged by the law. 
all who have sinned, it doesn't matter if you put law around yourself or if you don't have any rules around yourself, you're toast. We're just one big, massive lump of toasted humanity under God's wrath. Chapter 3, verse 9 says something similar. What then? Are we any better than they? Have we uh, distinguished ourselves from them? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. He's laboring to keep it, all of humanity intact under this one-size-fits-all indictment. No matter what we are, no matter what you have, no matter what you do, no matter what you haven't done, all have sinned. And in that condition, in that status, we are presently falling short of the glory of God. In verse 23 of chapter 3, fall short is a present tense. We are continually doing this. This is another way of describing the one indictment over all of us. We are presently falling short every hour, every day, and we're falling short of the radiant, impressive, weighty splendor of God. I'm going to remind you back in chapter 1, verse 23, look at this. I'm going to back up to verse 22. Professing to be wise, humanity became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You see, we didn't stop worship. We just exchanged the glory, the weighty, impressive splendor of the true God. We, we kicked him out and to spite him and to mock him, we said, let's pick an image of something really foul, like a, a reptile that crawls on its belly across the dirt. Let's worship that instead, and that'll spite God. Is what we are. We fall short every hour, every day of the weighty pre uh, splendor of God. There's no distinction because all have sinned no matter who they are. And there's no distinction because all are presently falling short of the glory of God in everything that we are and in everything we do. And you know, this is really helpful it may not seem like it, but it's really helpful for unrighteous sinners in the prison cell of unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath because for the unrighteous sinner who runs up to the bars of a cell and he tries to separate himself from the rest, pointing back to how rotten the guys in the dark are back there, you know. He's not with them. And he even agrees that with the judge that those guys back there, those guys should be hauled off by the executioner and they should, be, they should be killed. He agrees. For that one who rushes to the bars, the gospel says faith in Jesus Christ is the only hope for not being dragged off by the executioner. That one at the front has not distinguished himself and therefore, he is not above believing Jesus Christ because there is no distinction. What about you? Have you ever noticed yourself classifying yourself based on the character of others who are worse than you? You ever notice that? There is no distinction. And to the unrighteous sinner who is in the back, hiding in the shadows, in the, in the part of the cell that most unrighteous sinners are too afraid to go into, that one is not below the one hope and solution that is faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because there's no distinction like that. All have sinned and all are falling short of the glory of God. We are all have-nots in the dark in the back of the cell, in the tall weeds, inventing evil against the God we hate. 
no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've failed to do, faith in Jesus Christ is God's determined remedy for not just you, but for all unrighteous sinners. Have you believed Jesus Christ yet? Will you? Even now? Let's take one more. The fifth gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is this. Number five, God's righteous status or justification is God's gift by grace. Verse 24 of chapter 3 being justified as a gift by his grace. First, we need to figure out what being justified is connected back to up above it. Because the last part of verse 22 and all of 23 is a parenthesis, most likely being justified is connected back up to for all those who believe. In other words, for all those who believe, dot, 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 being justified as a gift by his grace. Justification here in this salvation context is connected to believing Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul has been saying. This is what he has meant regarding the revelation of or the manifestation of God's righteousness through faith. That is what is called being justified. Being justified means being declared by God to be righteous, get this, with his righteousness, with his righteous status. Understand this, being justified is not God declaring your righteousness valid in his sight. Do you understand that you would do some good works, try to do some righteousness, and being justified is not God declaring your version of righteousness to be valid in his sight. That's not it at all. It is God's judicial courtroom declaration that the unrighteous sinner has God's very own righteous status. And that righteous status of God came or was manifested, verse 21, by God through faith alone in Jesus. And that is for all who believe. To be justified through faith in Jesus Christ or to be declared righteous with God's righteous status through faith in Jesus Christ, it, it's more than being forgiven. We desperately need to be forgiven. But forgiveness is not the same thing as being declared righteous through faith. Or being declared righteous, it, it isn't just the absence of something terribly negative, meaning being declared righteous is more than God saying he won't condemn you. It's true, and boy, do we need that. Being justified through faith in Jesus is more than the absence of God's condemnation against us. Listen carefully. Being declared righteous with God's righteous status through faith means something primarily positive for you. What? That God will declare you to positively be something that you have never been on your own, but that he has always been. Righteous. He puts a title over you that is completely, entirely what you have never been. But that he has always been. And then he treats you according to that righteous status, as if you had only ever done what he does and what he is in every moment. And oh, what favor you have from him. Paul accents again that this justification or his declared righteousness that it has absolutely nothing to do with merit. Verse 
I'm going to sound like a broken record because we have one right here. Being justified as a gift. We don't earn it. It's not revealed by our good works. We are being justified as a gift by his grace. Literally, that as a gift means that all those who believe Jesus Christ are declared righteous without a cause without any cause in them. Without any cause in the unrighteous sinners. That means God looks for absolutely, understand this, it means that God looks for absolutely no change in your character first before he declares you righteous through faith. Underneath faith in Jesus That's through which God's righteousness comes. Underneath faith in Jesus, there is not some kind of attempt at self-reform so that there might now be a cause within us for God to declare us righteous through faith. There is no cause underneath your faith. Rather, while you are still, while I am still unrighteous in character and unrighteous in practice, God, without any cause within us, as a gift, simply through our faith in Jesus Christ, declares his status of righteousness over us. There's no cause within you that motivates him to do this. Only grace Moved him. Only unmerited favor moves a holy God to do this in you through faith. This righteous status through faith, it costs you nothing. But it doesn't mean that salvation is cheap. Because it cost the Son of God his life. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Meaning, and we'll talk about this next week, Lord willing, he shed blood when he died at the cross. It was payment, was the currency the only currency God would accept. His shed blood was the price he had to pay while you paid nothing for a righteous status that you could never generate yourself but that you desperately need to be saved. It cost you nothing, but it cost God's son his life. Look at verse 25. This Christ Jesus is the one whom God displayed publicly as a wrath-removing, wrath-satisfying death in his blood through faith. His shed blood was wrath-satisfying while you stood there provoking it, that wrath. Also that through faith in Jesus and his work at the cross, you might gain as a gift without any cause in you, by his grace, the righteous status of God that you don't have but that you must have. The righteous status that God gives and that God accepts. Because it's his own. What are you counting on? What are you counting on to be right with God? Let's pray. Oh Lord, may we never be ashamed of this gospel. No matter where we are in and among an unrighteous humanity. May we not be ashamed of it because we know it is the power 
of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Remind us, as often as is needed, Lord, that we are not believers today because we distinguished ourselves. As worthy, we didn't. There is no distinction. Humble us, even again today. So that when we step out into an unrighteous world, we are humble as we look at our fellow man. Father, thank you for the solution that you've provided outside of us. Thank you for faith. We believe that your righteousness is revealed through that faith. Thank you for giving us what we could never generate ourselves, but that we desperately must have if things are going to be different with you. Thank you, Father, that this is the foundation of life here and that this prepares us well for life eternal with you. Lord, this passage doesn't say to us everything about sanctification. It speaks about justification. Lord, may we get justification right. Help us to see where works are and where they are not in the Christian life, Lord. Fortify us with this. Lord, we thank you for what your son Jesus has accomplished for us. It's in his great name that we pray. Amen.